According to the Royal Academy of Spain, a desert is a sandy or pebbly territory that lacks or has little vegetation because of an almost total absence of rain. It is also an unpopulated or undeveloped area. The word desert is thus one of ample semantic range. It alludes to the most arid ecosystems on the planet, but it also evokes historical, literary, philosophical, and religious concepts. The concept of a desert is intimately tied to mankind's destiny. It was the desertification process that converted dense tropical rainforests of yore into African savannas, which in turn favored the first hominids to walk erect and the eventual appearance of the Homo genus in primeval Africa. It can be said that human beings are, to a certain degree, a consequence of both a primary desertification process and of the climate change that took place many hundreds of millions of years ago. Since the beginning, man has learned to live in the desert. And this is no coincidence. After the oceans, deserts constitute the largest ecosystem on the planet. More than 50 million square kilometers of land, constituting almost a third of the above water land mass, distributed among all continents alike. The first civilizations arose along river oases in deserts. The fertile crescent that extended throughout Mesopotamian Egypt saw the birth of the first stable communities based on agriculture and on animal domestication, destined to form pastoral societies. Thanks to the accumulation of man-made wealth, writing, government structures, and organized religions flourished there. In other words, the pillars of contemporary society. The three great monotheistic religions are linked to the desert, and they refer to it when they speak of purification and retreat. Hermitism was born there as a way to encounter one's own interior and give oneself to God. Revealed truth and theophanies became manifest in those non-places. There is where Yahweh revealed Mosaic law where Christ revealed the new law, and it was there where Muhammad had his own revelation. Notwithstanding its apparent physical limitations, the desert has been throughout history a fertile place for spiritual creativity. Anchorites already existed before Christianity, but it was during the height of Christianity when thousands of people consumed with religious fervor decided to live an isolated life in the desert, abandoning their families and material possessions. Deserts have many common characteristics, but they are also markedly different from one another, depending on the specific location on the planet they are in. However, we must realize that a desert is a natural ecosystem that can only be explained by the planet's atmospheric reality as a whole. All great deserts of the Earth come about as a consequence of two natural cycles that manifest themselves regularly. Some of the more well-known deserts originated from the Hadley Cell, a sustained rise of hot air that takes place near the equator. Thanks to it, the intertropical flows that arise from the humidity emitted by the evaporation and transpiration of tropical rainforests cause high-altitude storms that don't allow for precipitation in its environs. The Sahara Desert, the largest on Earth, as well as the Gobi Desert, are a consequence of this inexorable atmospheric phenomenon, as well as the Karakorum and the Kalahari Deserts. Deserts are simultaneously a consequence and a key factor in the delicate balance of the Earth's climate system.
The other cause for the existence of deserts are cold ocean currents, which, upon arriving on coastal areas, impede the penetration of the humid air mass towards the interior of the territories that border on coastal lines. These coastal deserts are usually located on the western border of continents close to the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. The most common ones can be found on the Pacific coast of the American continent, such as the Atacama, Chihuahua, Mojave, Sonora, and Colorado deserts. Some of them, like the Atacama, caused by the cold Humboldt ocean current, is considered to be the driest place on the planet. Although the common denominator among deserts is their extremely arid nature and their almost total lack of vegetation, they are extremely diverse from a morphological point of view. They can be categorized into three main topologies, sand deserts, rock deserts, and plateau deserts, better known by the Arab term Hamada, such as the one found on the northern fringe of the Sahara Desert. Deserts are far from homogenous, notwithstanding what some of their most typical depictions might show. The dunes of the Sahara, for example, which present the monotony of their infinite grains of sand and endless succession of dunes extending towards the horizon. The vast majority of deserts are quite morphologically diverse. Many are made up of fields of rolling hills, others of flatlands marked by trenches and protuberations molded by wind and the sun. We also sometimes find gorges and canyons nearby groups of hills and plateaus, salt fields, and of course, seas of sand. In all these cases, desert landscapes depend not only on their land types, which are at times rich in mineral deposits, but especially on wind processes. Polar deserts constitute a special type of desert. They are almost always subject to high atmospheric pressures due to the omnipresence of an anticyclone, which is why they have low or no yearly precipitation levels at all. The most common deserts of this type are the ones found in the interior of Antarctica and on the great ice mass in Greenland. Although such a large presence of water seems incongruent with the concept of a desert, the truth is that because the temperature is always below freezing, the ice makes it extraordinarily hard for life to take hold. Near the polar deserts, we find the tundra, open lowlands with permanently frozen subsoil, which mark the limits of plant life with respect to the poles. Steppes are ecosystems usually found on flat and vast territories, with a predominantly grassy vegetation and they are a product of extreme climate with scarce precipitation. Steppes share a great deal of characteristics of deserts, such as their aridness and the extraordinarily difficult conditions for the birth of life. Thus, they both display very similar landscapes that are difficult to distinguish upon first sight. On the other hand, steppes seriously risk becoming deserts as climate change continues to influence our planet. In recent decades, many of the prairies known for their tall and abundant brush have evolved toward a less abundant herbaceous and woody vegetation, thus becoming steppes, which at the same time run the risk of morphing into true deserts. 
They are usually found in regions far from the coast and are characterized by an extremely arid continental climate with great thermal variation between the long and cold winters and the short and hot summers, variations that even occur between day and night. The main limiting factor for life on the steppes is the scarcity of water, a consequence of low annual precipitations that rarely yield 250 millimeters on average. Their grounds are highly underdeveloped. They are rich in minerals, but have little organic substances, which makes them very hard, especially since they have never been plowed by man. The abundance of minerals in the steppes bestows spectacular hues upon their landscapes. Their characteristic red tone is an effect of the abundance of iron oxides that burst to the surface due to intense wind erosion. We also refer to cold deserts as steppes, in contrast to the predominantly torrid deserts like the Sahara. The complex system of landscapes and ecosystems that we know as the Gobi Desert in Asia justifies this denomination. In that inhospitable region, we find the Al Ashan steppes alongside plateaus like valleys and the Tian Shan cliffs. The steppes of the Iberian Peninsula, which are relatively abundant and are increasing in size, are a peculiar case because of both global warming and mankind's specific desertification processes. The steppes of Spain create wide open spaces that can be flat or softly undulating, and which are almost completely devoid of trees or developed brush due to how poor their land is, their high degree of salinity, and an extremely arid Mediterranean climate. They are thus quite different from Central European and American steppes, whose deep land provides for abundant herbaceous and brush vegetation. Their fauna, which is comprised of species adapted to hot summers and cold and dry winters, is in a perpetual state of precarious equilibrium, though herbivores such as the bison, horse, and fallow deer can be found. In the more arid steppes, characterized by harsh winters and brief periods of rain, we find small carnivores such as wolves and foxes, rodents, prairie dogs, and many reptiles, and arthropods that fill the biomass of these open spaces that at times seem completely empty. Even though the advancement of arid areas seems unstoppable, we could mitigate such an advance by properly managing our ecosystems. The example of such catastrophes as the one in the Aral Sea, which has become a saline desert because of the overexploitation and bad management of its natural cycle by man, or of large areas of the African coast, which have seen their fish populations decimated and their formerly prodigious waters converted into ghost boat cemeteries, should alert us to the perils of exerting too much pressure on natural resources, which lead to the disappearance of sources of life for many populations. The vastness of deserts has varied throughout history because of the climate mutations of our planet. For example, 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was a green area in which lush forests and grasslands housed a varied fauna. During a gradual process that spanned 3,000 years, tropical vegetation was progressively reduced until becoming first an arid savanna and then the largest desert on our planet. The presence of numerous anchorites in these lands shows that in the beginning of Christianity, life in the desert was possible, even as the likelihood of finding food and water diminished progressively over time.
When Arab colonizers arrived, they found a familiar ecosystem, similar in many ways to the one in the Arabian Peninsula from whence they'd come. We mustn't forget that Sahara in their language means desert. There are very few vestiges left of a varied vegetation as witnesses of its Mediterranean past, though most of these are in the form of palm trees found in oases and are the byproduct of Arab colonization. Palm trees are unusual plants that can reach 20 meters high. They are quite resistant, can easily adapt to all types of land, and can be found alone or in groups. Their exquisite dates provide nutrition. They offer shade to men and beasts, and they supply fibers that can be woven. But above all, they recall the illusion of the Garden of Allah in such an arid environment. A Saharan oasis is an isolated stopping point that offers water and vegetation, a type of rare fertile island in the middle of the sand. Small human settlements can be found in it thanks to an agricultural technique well adapted to this land. Historically, oases served as places for provisions and rest stops for caravans crossing the Sahara in an effort to communicate black Africa with the Christian nations of Europe. Even today, the tea ceremony reminds us of the peoples born from oases and to what extent these are welcome rest spots for travelers. Scientific data reveals that the desert has been inexorably advancing in recent decades and that it even affects areas beyond those that are potentially naturally arid, as shown by the desertification of certain areas close to rivers near the Mediterranean and in Central Asia. The time has come to be permanently alert to the consequences of our abusive exploitation of the planet, so that those areas that today are tropical rainforests don't one day become deserts. The Amazon now has very poor land quality because of the devastation of its biological wealth. It could go from being the lungs of the earth to a desolate area. In fact, every year, thousands of hectares of forests are destroyed, and the only cause of this ever-growing disaster is human ambition. These images show the catastrophic consequences of the great planetary equilibrium breakdown caused by pressure from mankind who is causing global warming, climate change, and an unforeseen chain of perverse consequences. The degradation of nature and the loss of biodiversity are the results of crimes committed by men upon Mother Gaia. Threatened species are thus the thermometers of such anthropic barbarism exerted on our planet. But mankind does not always behave like a predator. There are peoples who have adapted to their environment, exploiting it in traditional, sustainable ways, consistent with their nomadic way of life. There are races whose physique is, even today, adapted to such an extreme milieu, such as the Kung forest people, who populate the fringes of African deserts. Organized into small groups in which individuals work together, they still conserve a similar genome to that of the first humans who abandoned Africa to colonize the rest of the world. 
Traditionally linked to hunter-gathering activities, their natural habitats are the dry and semi-deserted steppes of Africa. Economic changes and demographic pressure on their ancestral territories has forced them to accept pastoral forms of life as a way to ensure their survival. The capacity of these African tribes to adapt to such an extreme environment is surprising. They have forged their own culture from this ability to survive, a far cry from the voracious predatory consumerism that ails the developed world. The Tuareg are another example of adaptation to a rough and difficult environment. They are the blue men of the desert, constantly present in the collective imagination of Mediterranean peoples. These primitive inhabitants of the Northern Sahara, who were there well before the Arab colonization of Northern Africa, have developed a nomadic way of life based on transhuman cattle raising that follows much older and more deep-rooted rules than Islam, the religion they practice. Their use of indigo has not only given them their name, but protects their skin from the intense ultraviolet rays and helps them to not sweat profusely, since such liquid loss would prove fatal in the desert. The inevitable question is, is there life in the desert? Undoubtedly so, much more than that apparent great void suggests. It is true that biomass is scarce and that its biodiversity is relative, as is the case in Antarctica. But deserts and polar masses teach us about the value of species during their adaptive processes, as they constitute the last biomes to be colonized by living beings, even in the abysses of the oceans. As in the bottom of the oceans, the fauna of the desert has also become proverbially used to the conditions of this extreme ecosystem, adapting their bodies to the rigors of permanent sunstroke and total aridity. Animals that live in this arid universe have developed ingenious mechanisms that take maximum advantage of the scarcity of water and the difficulty of finding food. The great mammals and herbivores that populate the arid savannas that border deserts defend themselves from sunstroke by resting in the middle hours of the days and actively seeking food at sunrise or sundown. Birds, and especially reptiles and rodents, have developed adaptation mechanisms that allow them to survive in the most adverse conditions. The plant life of desert areas is always on the fringes of survival. It is usually found in the form of shrubs and wisely manages scarce precipitation levels in an effort to survive. Xerophile plants, so characteristic of deserts, have developed two strategies for survival. The first is to avoid the loss of water through perspiration, which they are able to do by reducing the area of their leaves to a thin sheath or a simple thorn. The second strategy is their capacity to quickly store water during scarce rain seasons. Other xerophiles, such as those in the Atacama Desert, the most arid on the planet, actually rotate in search of those small drops of morning dew that can alleviate their hydric stress. Any gain, no matter how small, can mean the difference between life and death in these ecosystems, which are so adverse to the existence of life. And lastly, we cannot forget about the peculiar characteristics of desert grounds, which are often rich in minerals that allow for the existence of vegetation. The chemical composition of the substrate, combined with the harshness of climate conditions, force plants to develop varied and surprising morphologies.
perhaps the ultimate example of fauna that has adapted to the harsh conditions of the desert are camels and dromedaries. Their anatomy manifests their capacity to accommodate to both hot, sandy deserts as well as to cold and rocky ones. They are ensconced in a thick wool cover that serves as an air chamber, protecting them against both the cold at night and the heat during the day. Their knees and ankles are highly calloused, which makes them resistant to the heat of the sand when they sit and rest. Their capacity to resist dehydration has made them extremely valuable animals for life in the desert. Man takes advantage of pretty much every aspect of camels and dromedaries. Their meat is eaten, their skin is made into coats, and their excrement is used to light fires. But their endless carrying capacity, and especially their milk, is what is most valuable to the inhabitants of the desert. Almost all of the protein consumed by these people comes from milk and cheese. Thanks to their humps, camelids can store enough water and fat to survive in the desert for long periods of time. In the eyes of those who are unused to observing nature, Deserts lack life, but this assertion is quite false. A universe of reptiles, insects, and anthropods populate these apparently sterile sands. Life in this non-place, which is so hostile to human life, is in fact the highest expression of physiological and ecological efficiency on our blue planet. Are deserts useful? In nature, everything makes sense, even if it's apparently useless. And deserts perform a very important function in the equilibrium of the planet. They efficiently reflect light, protecting the Earth from an excess of solar radiation. Without deserts, the climate change that threatens the planet's equilibrium would undoubtedly be more acute. One of the most pernicious results of the greenhouse effect, which is a consequence of the emissions of toxic gases, is precisely the decrease of the planetary albedo and the resulting increase in temperatures that not only increase the desertification process, but also alter climate equilibrium with nefarious consequences to life in many areas of our planet. The natural logic of our planet is being altered by the predatory instinct of one of its species, mankind, who converts ecosystems that are not potentially deserts into areas of degradation. Another consequence of desertification is the alteration of the terrestrial climate and the increase in frequency of its most extreme phenomena. Prolonged droughts, soaring numbers of typhoons and hurricanes, violent storms and devastating floods, not only destroy valuable ecosystems, but further impoverish the lives of underprivileged human populations. We're probably not aware that if we continue to destroy the planet at the current pace, we'll have to look to life's capacity for survival in deserts for answers. Mankind's deeds cannot entirely do away with life on the planet, but they can force most mammals, including mankind itself, to subsist in highly unfavorable conditions and even place us all on the brink of extinction. Deserts also have massive cultural value. Their underbelly houses geological, paleontological, and archaeological remains that are exceptionally well conserved and have enormous patrimonial value. They're a kind of archive of humanity's memory that has allowed us to faithfully reconstruct the development of mankind's achievements. Even today, they can serve the secrets of our ancestors, and thanks to how isolated they are, the cultural strata vital for the knowledge of our own acts has been able to survive.
uncanny rock formations, caveman drawings, innumerable dinosaur fossils, Nazca lines and Nubian pyramids. All of these form a true heritage in which the history of the Earth and of its first civilizations has been registered. Its aridity, its extreme dryness, which makes life very difficult for living beings, is, however, an excellent ally for the preservation of the heritage that extinct civilizations left us. An endless current of spirituality surrounds deserts. Within its confines, the three religions based on the book were born. The most radical manifestations of those monotheistic beliefs have been expressed in a territory that has become a privileged location for encounters with God or with our human interior. Two centuries before the birth of Christ, Essenes moved to the desert to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Christian hermits retired to the desert to give themselves completely to a life of contemplation and penitence as a part of their spiritual world and their Christian deliverance. The Sufi also retired there to attain the highest degree of spiritual realization as part of their initiation path towards Islam. We see then that the apparent nothingness of the desert contrasts starkly with the fertile spiritual creativity that it has generated throughout history. Buddhist monks found exceptional energy centers in Tibet and in the Gobi Desert for communion with divinity. From a spiritual point of view, these centers are apt places to reach equilibrium and purification. The elements that help to transform the surroundings as well as the mind. They are then ideal places for meditation, the principal activity in Buddhism. Mohammed came from tribes that worshiped the spirits of the desert called jinns, the most important of which was known as Allah. The young prophet had visions of the archangel Saint Gabriel in the desert environment of Mecca and received the commandments to submit himself to the will of Allah. Thus, Islam was born. The opportunity and binding capacity of his message made it possible, for the first time in history, for a desert people to conquer large parts of the world and spread their own civilization, a civilization of the desert. In the vastness of Asia, Buddhism was born from an impulse to purify. Its spirituality, associated with a lack of material possessions, is a precursor of the future distilled asceticisms of Western deserts. It isn't strange, then, that the epicenter of Buddhism's spiritual geography can today be found in the high desert that is Tibet. In Ethiopia, more than 60% of the population practiced the Coptic variant of Christianity. The ancient realm of Aksum was one of the first African regions to adopt this Christian faith, 
that even today still conserves important hermetic manifestations and a strong monk structure reminiscent of the intense spiritual and intellectual activity of the first years of the Christian faith. The desert, then, symbolizes ascetic abandonment and flight from the world for the sake of meditation and union with God. Because of that, this concept is also important to the creation of the communitarian monks of St. Benedict of Nursia and in the spiritual searches of Western saints and mystics during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. St. Francis fleeing to Gubbio, St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross in their respective retreats. The word desierto, desert in Spanish, is literally used to designate the Carmelite monk foundations brought about by Father Tomás de Jesús in Spain during the latter part of the 16th century to describe life according to the strict rule of the descalzos, or the barefoot. They recreated the days of the mythical desert retreat of the prophet Elias, later remembered by a few crusaders who became hermits in Mount Carmel, according to the rule of St. Albert. In Spain, three Carmelite deserts were founded at first, in Bolarque, El Burgo, and Las Batuecas. And in the early 18th century, there were already 23 in the Catholic world. The first one was founded in the area of El Bolarque, originally located near the high Tagus River, though today it's located between the Entre Peñas and Buendia reservoirs, known as the Seas of Castile. Out there, a handful of hermit monks found refuge far from everything and everyone in order to dedicate their life to meditation, prayer, and the search for brotherly love. Mount Carmel in northern Israel was known for its fertility. Carmel means garden in Hebrew which is why Carmelite deserts are full of water, crops, and natural beauty. The term sand desert alluded to a rejection of material possessions, a concept wholly embraced back then by mystic Christianity. Today, in Batuecas, this Eden is a reality for a group of staunch monks from this area, isolated and remote on the border between the Salamanca and Peña de Francia and the mythical Urdes. Here, monks live in spirituality with the same intensity they did in the first centuries of Christianity, as if time and the evolution of the church were not their concern. The Carmelite Desert is close to the town of La Alberca, whose housing and aged population also seem to be stuck in the Middle Ages. Batueca is one of the two active Carmelite deserts in Spain, along with the one in Palmas de Benicassim. As one approaches its intricate valley, one gets the impression of approaching the ends of the earth. In the midst of a jagged terrain formed by this semi-tropical microclimate, it maintains the structure originally designed by its descalzo or barefoot founders, which responds to the Carmelite norm of simplicity and austerity. But not even this place has remained on the sidelines of history. It was abandoned as a consequence of the demortization of the 19th century. And hermetic life returned to it only in the last 60 years. The massive church is strategically located in the center, embraced by the three U-shaped crossways of the cloister. Here were the cells where the monks lived, as well as the rest of their rooms, they have been painstakingly restored to their original state.
As we go up this rough terrain, we see various hermitages designed to keep monks completely isolated, thus enabling them to live as hermits and practice their reformed Carmel monastic duties. The church's bells mark the times for common prayer and the rhythms of monastic life. The legends and myths of these lands spread through popular tradition and favored by the isolation this country went through until the 18th century, reinforces the feeling of asceticism and of being far from this world. The beauty of this valley is preserved by the fact that this was declared a natural reserve. Pine trees, birches, holly oaks, oaks, chestnuts, and cork oaks serve as refuge for the varied fauna in which animals like the black vulture, the stork, and the mountain goat thrive a landscape that has remained unaffected by human pressure. Convents also had a large and austere refectory, a place where those scarce moments of recess took place, as well as a wine cellar and a rainwater tank. The latter two remain very well conserved among the ruins of Bolarque. These spiritual centers are also an example of life in harmony with nature and of respect for the ecology. Here, nature is only required to provide what it can. Monks here are self-sufficient through their crop gardens and they renounce the life of crazed consumerism that characterizes post-capitalist society. The townships around the monastery, such as Alberca, also seem to enjoy the serenity that is elicited by the Carmelite Desert. As we quietly walk through this town, we can enjoy its streets and plazas, all framed in popular architecture based in stone and in geometric patterns of wood. We are in the midst of a global phenomenon that affects our environment and that is even more pressing than demons, spirits, or the sinful world of yesteryear. Contemporary terrors are as clearly pinpointed by science, but are ignored by economic interest and short-term political strategies. Notwithstanding the influential and irresponsible reality deniers, the diagnostic of our sins is clear, though the solutions are apparently less so. Based on simple-minded political calculations, many authorities refuse to clearly state what measures are necessary for the survival of our species. Are we still in time to stop the destruction of our planet? Governments and citizens seem to be more aware, a fact that is manifested by the agreements, though precarious, of the latest international summits. The youth of the world express their outrage at the slowness of the actions being taken and demand unequivocal political will and coordinated action to stop the progressive desertification that has become even more acute by climate change. It is not only minorities anymore, but an ever-growing human wave that demands strong answers and responsible measures. The road is clear. Now we must embark upon it. Deserts have to begin to show positive signs as thermometers of global climate. Scientists have shown that the recent variations in the size of the Sahara Desert are due to oscillations in climate. But though it may seem paradoxical, climate change also threatens deserts. And if they are lost, we risk losing not only animal and vegetable species, but also incredible landscapes and invaluable remains of ancient civilizations. The great lessons imparted by the men and cultures that lived in the desert and took advantage of its natural and spiritual potential are now more necessary than ever. They were able to overcome the limitations that the harsh conditions of the desert impose on mankind, and they were also able to understand that the desert is not a barrier between various groups of humans, but a place for contact and community. Hence the importance of integrating them into our lives, 
deserts have unwillingly become the mirror of the future of our species in this new millennium. must observe the desert with intelligence and treat it with respect, since an important part of our destiny depends largely on its value as an oracle. <laughs>